Moses found himself in what I call a sticky situation. Uh, God used Moses to, or God wanted to use Moses to speak to Pharaoh about letting the Israelites go. And um, Moses objected to this, uh, saying he couldn't speak eloquently enough. And then God said to him something really weird. God said, use your stick, your staff, to go and assist in freeing a nation. You can only imagine what Moses thought about this idea. And um, so the reality is Moses did proceed. And the question I ask is, why did he proceed with this? Why did, God, why did Moses actually go using his stick, his staff, to go and uh, speak to Pharaoh? And the reason I would suggest was that Moses knew that God was faithful. Moses had had an amazing encounter with God uh, at the burning bush. In fact, he had had many encounters with God, and he knew it. And these encounters gave him the encouragement, the strength to confidently proceed. Good news for you. I, too, have a stick. And... um, I think of uh, Ice Age, what was his name? Sid, with this stick and my highly evolved brain, I shall make fire. Or the Christian version, with this stick and my highly evolved God, we shall make fire. Um, Hopefully we can make fire today in a positive sense. Uh, Encounters with Jesus have been our theme for the last 10 weeks. And today I get the opportunity to wrap this one up. We move on to a a new series next week. Um, And what I wanted to do was discuss what can come as a result of these encounters, what they look like, and and so on. These encounters have been different. We've looked at uh, the father and his demonized son. We looked at Jesus and the hungry crowd. We looked at Jesus with Pilate, Jesus in creation, Jesus standing there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, Jesus with the woman who was caught in adultery. The mum whose son was raised from the dead by Jesus. Peter in the garden. And last week, my favourite one of them all, um, thanks Don, um, the man who was blind encountering Jesus. And today we're going to finish off. There was obviously many, many more uh, encounters with Jesus in the Bible, but today the last one we're looking at is the centurion... Julius, who indirectly encounters Jesus through Paul. Quite a long text, and I really love this text because I can relate to it. It's a, there's a whole nautical theme, and this is about Paul being shipwrecked along with the rest of his crew. I'll read it to you. When it was decided that we should sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. Small caveat here, please. These words are really, really, really easy to pronounce in your mind. <laughs> not in, in out your mouth. So bear with me. I'm a math teacher, not a, a something else teacher. We um, boarded a ship from Adramathim. If you pronounce it differently, feel free. That's great. Um, about to sail for ports along the coast of province of Asia. Got that one. And we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. Remember, Paul's a prisoner. He must have had a pretty good relationship with this guy, to, uh, with the centurion, for the centurion to let him do this. Verse 4. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. It goes on, doesn't it? Uh, There the centurion found an, an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Snidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete, opposite Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty 
and came to a place called Fair Havens. I like that place. Um, near the town of Lasia. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. Uh, I suspect he's alluding to the winter coming along. Um, so, uh, just going off. Uh, so, Paul warned them Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot um, and the owner of the ship. Since the harbour was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbour in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. Clearly, this, clearly somehow that's better for wintering. Um, a small interlude here. Paul tries to warn them. And you can only imagine the centurion going, uh, you don't really want to go to Italy, do you? You're going to go and see Caesar. Um, you're trying to get out of this, uh, trying to stall. Um, so Paul was ignored. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel that this happens to us, that I can relate. I sometimes feel that I'm ignored. Uh, sometimes we speak up in great sincerity and, and then we get discouraged because our thoughts are not appreciated and um, we, we feel ignored. Anyway, let's carry on the storm. Verse 13. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw the opportunity. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore to Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed the lee of a small island called Corda, Corda, uh, I kind of found that quite amusing. Uh, what do you call the island called Corda? Anyway, um, as we passed to the lee of a small island called Corda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. And you suddenly get the impression that this was some storm. They were a bit scared and they're panicking. Imagine tying ropes under your boat to hold it together. Uh, these, these are quite significant boats and um, I'm not sure what a few ropes would do. Because, uh, I should carry on, because they were afraid that they would run aground on sandbars of Cytus, they also lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. Sea anchors slow down the boat, and they drag and slow you right down, which is kind of good. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. Desperate measures. On the third day of this big storm, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When near the sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Many days of struggling, quite a few days of struggling, and now what has happened? What's the difference? Now they've all lost hope. Maybe now they'll be ready to listen to Paul. Let's carry on. Verse 21. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sell from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. Had he stopped there, they might have been slightly annoyed with him, do you think? Um, but fortunately, he carries on. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, Do not be afraid. Paul, you must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sailed with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Paul had an encounter with Jesus that night, and most commentaries would agree that the angel of the Lord was Jesus himself, um, and this gave Paul the courage to speak up, just like Moses had the courage to speak up because he had an encounter with God. 
Let's carry on. The shipwreck itself. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across. 14 nights, I don't know about you, I watched the Sydney to Hobart, and I remember that really severe one we had a number of years ago. Uh, I can't remember what date, but it was bad. That's not 14 nights. And when you start to see what happens to sailors after just a few days of bad weather, uh, it's incredible how people start getting seasick, things happen. Um, 14 days, I can't imagine just how bad this was. Uh, on the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching land. Small pause, how did they sense that? They had no GPS. Um, the sensors are likely to be rougher seas. As you get to shallower water, the seas start getting bigger. Maybe they heard uh, the shore break in the distance. I, I don't know what it is, but how do you sense this at night? They can't see it. Um, verse 28. They took soundings, not the type of soundings we did, the electronic ones, but they took soundings with ropes and knots and things like that and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was now 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. 14 days of the storm, and then they drop anchors and they stay there. They were scared. They were petrified, no doubt. Verse 30. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul says to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Um, another interlude there. Who cuts the ropes of a life raft and let it drift away when you're in the middle of a storm? That is quite something. Um, Paul must have somehow convinced these guys that he had heard from God. Because you wouldn't just do this lightheartedly. How is it and what is it that happened that they really, really believed Paul about his encounter with Jesus? Verse 33. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Paul here, he's the prisoner. Uh, and yet they're listening to him in their time of desperation. I would argue that perhaps God allowed those circumstances to prevail. God allowed that storm to prevail. Surely, um, it had to happen because without that, they paid no attention to him at the beginning. Through the storm, uh, in those circumstances, those people became desperate and suddenly they were able to or willing, were willing to listen to Paul. Verse 34. Now I urge you, take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After this, he said, oh sorry, after this, after he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. And then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. This is the clincher. There were 276 of us on board. We've got a neighbour in Gulwa. He is a, a, a cook on a, a cargo ship. And he proudly tells us how he cooks all the food for the crew, all 10 of them. All right? And because these days things are different. And I don't know about you, but... If I'm going to make a wild statement about all of you are going to survive, it's much easier when there's 10 versus 276. That was a bold statement that he made, um, 276. Paul certainly seemed to have the attention of all these guys. And um, amazing. They all sat there and they all listened to him. They were all encouraged as he broke bread. When they eaten, when, verse 38, when they had eaten as much as they wanted, they further lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. And when daylight finally came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. 
Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken into pieces by the pounding surf. We're almost done. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. How quickly the tables turned. The, the soldiers, they were just a few moments ago encouraged by Paul and his words of encouragement and breaking bread, all these things, and yet and a few minutes later they wanted to kill all the prisoners, including Paul. Quite something. Um, people can turn really, really quickly. Anyway, he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on the planks or other piece of the ship. And in this way, everyone reached land safely. Uh, let's carry on. Verse 20, uh, chapter 28. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and, as he put it on the fire, a viper was driven out by the heat and fastened itself onto his hand. When the islanders saw this, saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for he has escaped from the sea. The goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. How often do we do this? We, we, we see someone going through hard times and we make this assumption, they've done something wrong. Surely they deserve this. Surely bad things have happened to this guy um, because uh, he has walked away from the will of God. Um, very, very quick to happen. But what happens here? I know, Paul, as if he's not gone through enough. The storm, the shipwreck, the, all this, people turn on him and then he gets bitten by a snake. But what does Paul do? Paul shook off the snake shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to uh, Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us into his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. Another small interlude here is maybe, and this is, who knows if this is true or not, but maybe being bitten by that snake was actually another bit of hardship that Paul needed to go through to get the attention of the villagers, which clearly he did, had had, and maybe that was his ticket into this guy's house. This guy has suddenly welcomed Paul into the house. Um, this guy, Publius, verse 8, his father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer placed his hands on him and healed him. And when this had happened, the rest, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honoured us in many ways and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies that we needed. That's the end of the text for now. That is amazing. Uh, um, there's quite a bit that we could unpack from that and boy will I. Um, Paul, Paul, you know, when, when you think about it, Paul, he was going to Italy to see Caesar, and God could have directly taken him directly there, um, and yet God had uh, other plans. Uh, other plans which are a little bit distracting, a little bit hard, a little bit arduous. Um, Paul had to endure suffering along with the soldiers and crew in order to be able to impact them. Uh, Paul was in there with them. He was in that boat. He, he was also probably hungry, 14 days worth, um, a reminder as Christians we're not promised a life of comfort we're promised a life of purpose we're promised a life of encouragement we're promised a life of meaning and some of those processes might be uncomfortable on the way there might be times when we endure storms metaphorical storms in our own life there might be times where we are bitten by metaphorical snakes hopefully not real ones um, but often Often the first thing that happens when, when these storms approach us is we kind of go, oh, what did I do wrong? Where are you, God? What's going on here? Um, you've ditched me. And yet, clearly in the circumstance, God allowed these things to happen to Paul 
to soften the hearts of those around him. I know God doesn't like watching us suffer and go through hardships, but I know he loves the, the results of those situations and this situation. Why? Many people in that village, well, all the people in those villages were healed. Uh, that was quite a process that they followed. Question, where are you at? Do you want to be used by God? And if so, don't be surprised when you seem to be in a major storm where all those around you um, have lost hope of being saved. When you personally get bitten by snakes, however they may look like in your life, this is the ideal time to demonstrate God's love and his faithfulness. Uh, Encounters with Jesus make us strong witnesses. Paul had that encounter on the boat. He was a strong witness. They listened to him for some reason. Paul must have been really convincing about his encounter with Jesus on the boat. Uh, We are witnesses of Jesus and his interactions on this planet. What an amazing privilege. I don't know about you, but I want to be convincing like Paul was um, and get people's attention. Uh, Except they need to be in a circumstance where they're ready to hear it. (laughs) Don't know about that bit. Um, In a court of law, in a court of law, it's not the witness's job to convince the jury of all the case facts. All the case facts. The witness simply is to relay their encounter with the circumstances of the case, what, perhaps what they saw, what they heard, what they had tasted, I mm, don't know about that, um, maybe, or felt, their experience of what they had seen and heard. And in the same way, we are to witness our experience, our encounter with Jesus. The Holy Spirit is like the barrister in a court of law, who brings about the circumstances and the witnesses together to convince the jury of a case. And I love this. Uh, Hearsay is not admissible in court. You might be wondering where I'm going with this, but bear with me. Um, And in the same way, your witness needs to be about your encounter with Jesus. The soldiers believed Paul because he relayed the details of his encounter with Jesus. I don't know, I'm not an academic by any means. Uh, I don't know all the answers and I had great respect for people who can connect all the dots and connect this verse to that verse and memorise the stuff. Uh, not for me. I can't do it. I wish I could and great admiration. But I do know Jesus and I have had encounters with him. Some big and some, if you can say such a thing, incidental small ones. Um, I'll tell you a small story here. There was a man. Some of you may have heard the story before, but bear with me. And you smile and wave afterwards. Um, this began to rain, and the man noticed that the floodwaters were starting to arise around his house. And he realised that a flood was coming. So what does he do? He prays, "God, help me, please, please, God, help me." And um, so, sure enough, within minutes, a four-wheel drive comes along the track to his house. It can get through the, the waters. Hey, buddy, who's this man's name? Let's call him Hewan for argument's sake. Uh, Hewan, let's, we're here to rescue you. What does Hewan say? No, God, uh, don't worry about it. I'm good. God said he would rescue me. I'm good. Uh, short while later, the, the, the four wheel drive leaves. Uh, the waters continue to rise. A boat turns up. Hey, Hewan, we're here to rescue you. Get on our boat. We've we come to save you. No, no, no I'm good. I'm good. Uh, God, I prayed to God, and God said that he would rescue me. I'm good. Don't you worry. They disappear. A short while later, a helicopter comes, and the same occurs. Guess what happened? The guy drowned. Uh, sorry, Hewan. He, he drowned. And um, so Hewan makes a beeline straight to God and says, hey, I've got a bone to pick with you. Uh, you told me you would rescue me. You told me that I would be saved. And the response from God, how many opportunities did I have to send you? You did not recognise the opportunities when they came your way. You did not recognise the possible encounters that I tried to provide for you. Um, We need to recognise the encounters with God in our lives. But they often look different. We look at the last 10 weeks of preachers and they're all different examples. So I wish I could say to you, an encounter with God looks exactly like this, but we can't. 
uh, they all look so different. Uh, last week we looked at um, the man who was blind, and Don highlighted the stages of this man recognizing who he had had an encounter with. Um, as the man was questioned, he reflected, and his description of Jesus changed progressively from the man they called Jesus to uh, the prophet, to someone to be a disciple of, to being the son of man, to be worshipped. As he reflected, he recognised his encounter with Jesus and it just got deeper and deeper, his, his, his appreciation of what had actually happened. And as a witness, he had the perfect answer, and I love the answer because it sets me free. When he was questioned about how Jesus had done his work and who Jesus was in John 9.25, the guy who was blind replies with this, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Don't feel the pressure that we have to explain and reason everything. Don't feel um, that we have to know all the answers. The Holy Spirit's doing his job. The Holy Spirit is the one drawing different witnesses around. What are we to do? Share, the, share our encounters and the facts that we have. Can you imagine, uh, at the time, Paul's on the ship. Uh, Paul, you say you saw a vision of Jesus and he was with you. Uh, how did that happen? Uh, we don't really see anything about Paul trying to explain how he saw the angel of the Lord. Um, he simply relayed his, his encounter and that was enough. The blind man did the same. When Jesus fed the hungry crowd, uh, the people ate the food. I, I don't know, there's nothing about them saying, well, where did this come from? Uh, is, it, is it safe? Uh, what's the use by date? Um, they ate the food. This encounter with Jesus was huge for them too. When Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were saved in the furnace, they didn't have to say anything. Their lives were clearly saved by Jesus and this was quickly recognised by the king and by others. So encounters with Jesus should change us. They should inspire us. They should motivate us. They should encourage us. Uh, and, should, and in turn, we should use these encounters to help uh, uh, share the love of Jesus. And we should be encouraging other people. It's not all just for us, nice as that would be. Um, Paul's encounter wasn't just for Paul. It was used to save those around him, and God's love th flowed through Paul to those around him. Uh, Acts 29, uh, 28 verse 9. Just a reminder, when this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island were, came in and were cured. What a series of events to get to that point. Um, what encounters have you had? Or at least, what encounters with Jesus have you recognised in your life? I've got no doubt you've had many encounters with Jesus, but sometimes I think we just don't necessarily recognise him. Um, I think we, we have big memorable ones, and we have the everyday chatting with God ones, as I like to think of it. In, in preparation for this, this talk, I asked God to help me relay his heart, and he challenged me to carry around this little book. Um, and I did so on the train um, for, 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 for quite some time. And every time I felt a prompting from God about this talk, because I wanted it to be relevant, I would simply write down a dot point in this, and it resulted in page after page of dot points. The mission was to compile it, I guess. But those are all individual, small encounters with God, but compiled makes something big. So I would certainly not want to discount the value of small incidental um, encounters with God. Seek God daily, just as you would spend time um, daily with your spouse or a friend to develop a strong relationship. We can't live on the mountain with Jesus permanently. That would be nice. Um, we have to come down to our ordinary lives. However, just like with your, with your spouse, there should be some memorable moments and there should be some memorable encounters and we enjoy those. Um, but we need to also live in the ordinary, everyday life. When Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments on the mountain, he might have been tempted to stay there. Uh, when it says, the Bible says, he was radiating the glory of God when he came down. Maybe he was tempted to stay there. God, this is good. Happy days. I'm going to stay here with you. 
But we know that while he was up there, a little bit of chaos was happening down below, and God needed him to return to everyday life to lead his people. I was on a year eight camp a couple of months ago for, for school, and I was asked at dinner time if after dinner I would like to do a, a talk to the year eights. And I said, sure, what about? Anything you like. All right, okay, fair enough. How much time have you got? Have I got uh, about an hour? And I, what, what, an hour? We need to, and um, so I hastily started writing down on a napkin at the table, at the table some dot points. And these dot points being exactly this topic, encounters with God. What I wanted to relay to the year eights is, it's not about how much you know, it's who you know. And the experiences you have with God, because that's what gives you the courage, that gives you the motivation. Uh, these dot points included dot points like this. My first memorable encounter, God even loves an eight-year-old. Uh, another dot point, you could be dead by the morning. <laughs> um, being loaned $100,000 for a week for free. Uh, we like those ones. Um, there's still stress involved in that stuff, by the way. Um, meeting my wife at a train station. Yeah, we like that too. Um, hard times at 2 a.m. A simple chocolate. God loves. All right. And I said to the year eights, you can pick two or three of any of these, and I'll start telling you a story about two or three of these stories. And it's kind of easy for me because... Um, they're, they're my encounters. They're my witness. I don't need to write them all down. And in fact, even now, at this point, I'm going to tell you one or two of these little stories, but there's no script for it. It's amazing because that's in the heart. That's embedded. Just like Paul on the ship. He was convincing enough because it was his encounter. I'll go back to my first memorable encounter. Parents, please don't discount or underestimate the, the connection with God that he wants to have with your children. God, as an, as an eight-year-old, here's a story for you. My dad made for me one Christmas. Um, <laughs> that's okay. My, my dad made for me a little wooden boat about this long. And um, it was painted yellow. It was really nice. It had a little engine on the back, and I used to send it across the pool and it was great. But it was more fun to actually put a string onto the front. I put a little eyelet on the front and a string about a meter long. And I would take this sometimes down to the creek at the bottom of our garden. We had a little creek over there, which ordinarily was a tiny little stream. But I took this boat down once after some heavy rain. And after some heavy rain, this creek was a lot more fun. And so the water would rise quite significantly. And I could put my boat in there and I could hold it and I could wash, watch the water rushing by. I told you, water was always my thing and boats was always my thing. Um, and I love this. And, and one day I'm there, I'm holding the string and I'm playing in the water like this. And the boat capsized, rolled and went down underneath the water. Oh, okay, fair enough, pull it up. But to my horror, when the boat came up, it was missing a small component. On the top of this boat, there was a little wooden cabin thing, and on top of that, there was something like this one that I made up, a tiny little lid. And you can see there's a little groove around there over there that would clip onto the boat and hold that thing down. And you took the lid off so as to be able to get batteries inside and things like that. Um, it was kind of cool. But the boat came up without this lid. And I panicked slightly. And I thought, what? this is not good. This is not good. Um, not so much because I, I really like the lid, but the realisation that I'm going to have to come clean about what uh, mum and dad had actually said to me, you don't go down to that creek when there's lots of water. Um, don't do this. It's dangerous. And that became my number one concern. So I had a solution, as every child does. I, I took the boat upstairs and put it under my bed. Solved. <laughs> Solved. However, that night and a few days later, I suddenly had this realisation that it's not going to work for long. Um, this, this solution is not such a good one. Excuse me. I, um, I realised that no, Dad's eventually going to notice that this boat is missing this component, this big yellow lid on top. So I 
resorted to prayer. These are, these are, as an eight-year-old, these are, these are uh, catastrophic times in, your, in an eight-year-old's life. So I resort to prayer. God, help me, please. And um, I'm going through ordeals, crisis here. And God said to me, go and look for the lid. So I did just that. I went down to the creek and I walked. Now, we used to play in this creek a lot. And by now, this is a, a few days later, the water had gone back to its normal level. And I thought, this can't be that hard. She walked down. I walked about a, a kilometre and a half looking for this big, bright yellow lid. No, nothing. I was pretty upset with God because clearly he'd let me down big time. And um, go back to the house and you, know, and you start to question, I, did I hear God right? What's going on over here? So God obnoxiously, in my opinion, uh, further clarified. He said, Derek, don't go back to the creek where you were looking. Go back to the creek where you lost it. Now what? And kind of like you can imagine the disciples on the boat uh, put the nets on the other side. What are you talking about? As if that makes any difference, the other side of the boat, all right? Um, silly idea. So anyway, I've, desperate times, def- desperate measures, I went back to the creek. And um, I went down and I had a look, and there, there was a stick. And on the stick, um, which had been submerged at the time because of the water, on the stick was hanging this little lid like this. Now, bear in mind, it had been under the water, submerged. The, many other things had come washing by, and literally at the point where I lost it, this lid was hanging there. And you can see how easily it falls off. Um, I don't know. That to me, at that moment, um, there was a moment in time where I realized I had had an encounter with God, my encounter with God, one that meant something to me, something that, where God said, I love you and I care for you. And I do remind us that God's not Father Christmas in this circumstance, but he used that circumstance to help me out. Uh, what is also interesting is because I had that encounter with God, I had great courage and excitement. You know what I did with this story? I went straight to my mum and said, Mum, guess what happened? Forgetting <laughs> one minor detail. You shouldn't have been there in the first place, Derek. Um, but that didn't matter. I suddenly had this encouragement, this courage to go and share what God had done and how God had spoken. How good is that? And the fact that I can still remember that four years later is incredible. Um, more than 40, actually. Anyway, uh, let's carry on. A- another one. And I, when I was about 19, I bought a chocolate at a shop once, uh, in the days when we used to eat lots of chocolate. Um, it was nice, wasn't it? Who likes chocolate? Anyone like chocolate? Chantel, you like chocolate. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, it must be nice. Um, anyway, I remember buying a chocolate and thinking at the time, I was still living at mum and dad's house, uh, there's a lady, that Melanie, who used to help mum and dad uh, with some cleaning, just to help mum out a bit. So I thought to myself, oh, I'll just buy her a chocolate too, and I'll buy her a chocolate. And when I got to the house, I said, hey, here you go, Mel, I bought you a chocolate. Thought nothing of it, and I had to go out shortly thereafter. Mum relayed a story to me about that. Because when she got home uh, an hour or two later, there was this Mel, now long uh, since should have left, and, um, but sitting in the lounge in tears. And mum obviously panicked, what she'd done to the house. But um, when, when the story got relayed, what it amounts to was Mel said to, this, to my mum that nobody had ever given her anything unwarranted like that before, outside of Christmas, birthdays, something like that. She had just had an encounter with God through actions that another Christian had put on. A simple chocolate, a simple little thing like that had had a massive impact on this lady. And I say that because I take great courage from that. It wasn't hard work to simply buy a chocolate. Uh, uh, Harold and Ruth told me two stories before this meeting, how Harold hung up a, a, a sign said, God is able, and that impacted a neighbour. Um, so easy. Ruth told me another story, which completely eludes me right now. I can't tell you what it is now, but it was something similar. So easy, all right? And I think neither of them had the intention of actually trying to do the great work of God. They were just responding to the small things. I prefer these options to being shipwrecked on a ship. I don't know about you. But um, uh, like the blind man who didn't care about the consequences of speaking about Jesus, um, 
neither do we sometimes when we know something powerful has happened in our lives. Um, my year eight kids at school, they were captivated for the full hour, as was I. I kind of enjoyed that. Sorry, my laptop's doing weird things. Um, and in preparation for this talk, about four weeks ago, though, I said to God, you know what, I don't want to just talk about old encounters. I want to have a fresh one, uh, something, something that smells good um, and new. So I asked God to help me or to see or to have an experience um, and another encounter, uh, selfishly really, to make me feel good and motivated, I guess, but um, then I could share it with you and make you feel good, but anyway, number one first. Um, and I asked for an encounter with him, so I may relay something to you. Uh, a week or so later... Uh, Hewan and Lucy were talking about uh, schoolies and how they really needed some help. So I thought, well, yeah, I can help with that. That'd be nice. And we got involved in that schoolies program. And that program reached a peak for me when uh, John, John is amazing. You all like John? John's good. We should make John's. No, anyway, let's not do that. Um, when John and I, John and I walked around Victor Harbour and we were, we were. Uh, felt like uh, celebrities. The, 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 the schoolies are going, green team, green team, and high-fiving us, and you're like, wow, what's going on over here? Um, this is quite something. But I had this small epiphany. Many of these kids were genuinely experiencing and recognising the love of God, perhaps for the first time, or making that connection for the first time. How did they make that connection? Well, when we're asked why were we helping, we could openly say to them, we're here because we love you and we love you and care for you and we value you because we serve a God who does the same and it's God who wants us to help and be a part of your lives. What an amazing testimony. They can't get this message at a public school. A teacher can't say these things at a public school. And um, so for many of them, they were suddenly having this uh, uh, these new neuro pathways connecting God to being an amazing person. And they were seeing that love through Green Team, the people who, who, who volunteered. Um, anyway, after this weekend, being, being a bit slower than I am, I, I thought, that's nice, God, that's been a great interlude, but I still am looking for this encounter, please, that I want to be able to share with the, um, with, with the, the church. And and I, I kept praying that. And then I, God said something to me quite profound. Derek, you wanted an encounter. So what did I do? I put you down at Encounter Bay to work with Encounter Youth so you can have an encounter with the students and you can see the love of God in their lives. Um, it's quite something because that encounter, those students were encouraged as was I. And it did cost us something. We, had to, we have still sacrificed time, weekend, money um, to be involved. I'm almost done, sorry. I asked my year eights, um, as to whoever them would like stories like this, which of them would like stories, witness accounts like the one that I had told them, or the ones. And every single one of them said that they would like such stories. I've got the advantage of being like 40-something years ahead of them, but um, no, not that much. Um, they had been impacted by my encounters with God and my chosen stories had included both positive and negative experiences, like the joy of meeting Charlotte and the circumstances around that, but also the pain of my mum dying of cancer. Both were part of my stories and despite those negative and sometimes painful sufferings and hardships, my year eight still desired such encounters. Another question that I pose to them and to you today, if God is big enough to create this world, is he surely not big enough to connect with you, to show you things, to speak to your heart, be open to having, uh, be open to having encounters with Jesus and to recognise these encounters in your life and share those encounters as your witness to those around you. Remember, these encounters come in different forms, different circumstances, some of them comfortable, some of them not. Uh, a really annoying friend once said this to me, and I still call him a friend, Derek, we all love a miracle. We all love to have these encounters, but not many of us want to be in a position, position where we really need one. 
I, I want to have these miracles. I want to have these encounters. I want to have, but selfishly, I don't want to be in a position where I desperately need them. Um, speak of your encounters. They are your witness. Let the Holy Spirit do his work to bring other witnesses and to fill the whole picture. It's not our job to try and convince someone of all the facts, but our witness should be enough. I was trying so hard to be a good witness uh, um, over the years, to memorize scriptures um, for every circumstance, and it was all just too much. And I love the fact that that guy, the blind guy, says, I don't know how that happened. All I know is I was blind, and this guy healed me. I don't know why he's put spat on the sand. Who cares? I don't know why he did this, but I know that this guy is a prophet. In fact, I know that he is the son of man. In fact, I know that I should be worshipping him because he's awesome. That was from his encounter. Uh, the blind man in that was actually, ironically, he was Mr. Average, and yet he was accused of trying to teach the leaders of the time. That's how powerful his words were. They said, you're trying to teach us now. And, um, and you know what? He was. Um, but all he was doing was speaking of his encounter. A small warning. If you ask, if you ask, God will respond. Uh, Luke 11.10 says, For anyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. 